Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. Kenneth King was born in Shanghai, attended high school in Hong Kong, studied architecture at Northern Polytechnic in London, and received an MArch degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. Ken's early career focused on hospital design, which allowed him to develop an expertise in critical efficiencies and layered circulation systems. This eventually led him into waste management, transportation, and master planning projects. After a long and successful career, Ken co-authored the book Vertical City, a solution for sustainable living, the first and only book ever written on the Vertical City concept. Ken also founded verticalcity.org, a not-for-profit organization that sponsors this podcast and is dedicated to inspiring the creation of the world's first vertical city. Ken, welcome to the Vertical City podcast. Thank you, Lennon. I've heard a few different explanations of what a vertical city is. How do you define a vertical city? Vertical city is a recent term. To date, no one has clearly defined what the vertical city is all about. Most people view a super tall building as vertical city. Even among our profession, when they design a super tall building, they also call it vertical city. It is not true. All the buildings built today are multifunction buildings, and most of them consist of offices, hotel, residence, commercial spaces, and few of them have included parks and cultural facilities, etc. Technically, these buildings cannot be termed vertical city. In a true sense, vertical city means a city which is designed vertically to accommodate all the functions of a city, including functions such as governmental facilities, hospitals and clinics, schools, offices, retail shops, as well as large department stores movie houses, theaters, and various other entertainment places. It must contain everything needed to service its residents and provide its residents a better quality of life. So you've been working on this concept of a vertical city for quite some time now. What inspired you to do so? Well, you know, I was born in the 30s. And at that time, the all the cities go along their ha- happy old ways, and, and there's no pollution problems. You know, all the ways are, are reused and recycled one way or the other. So, so we don't have much of a, a, a pollution problems. Many, most houses don't even have, don't have heating or air conditioning, and there are very few cars on the road. So whatever cars, cars we have on the road doesn't create enough to make the atmosphere polluted. But today, you know, after the Second World War, the, the industry and technology move so fast, and, and we are building so many cars every day. Uh, and uh, when these cars get on the road, all of them create pollutions. And when you add up to the millions and millions of cars that we have today, the pollution we have is too much for the environment to neutralize. So, so the pollution seems to be with us day in and day out. And there was one moment I've heard you tell before where you kind of first conceived of the vertical city concept. Is that correct? When you were stuck in a taxi? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, many years ago, you know, I was going to a meeting and I was strapped. Um, I think it's Park Avenue. And Several cars ahead of me also come to a stop because there's there's people using jackhammer to try to open up the streets. So so after about ten or fifteen minutes, I decided to step out of the car to see what happened, and I saw a few con ed workers are trying to open up the street to come to some pipes that are leaking and. Most people are stopped by this incident for about 20 minutes or so before they can get by the, the repair. So I'm thinking to myself, 
with thousands of cars trying to go by just one repair. And it happens in many parts of the city every day. There's so much wasted energy. I say to myself, there must be a better way. So after this experience being held up in, um, by the con and repairs, what did you do next? You know, while I, while I was working, you know, this problem has consistently lost in my mind. But there's nothing I can do because, because I need all the time to be in my office, you know, pushing out projects after projects. Until after I, I'm retired and I went to a party and talked to a friend of mine, Kellogg Wong, and I brought this problem up that, you know, with all the problems that have been haunting us for all these years, why don't we start sitting down and see if we can write a book to solve all these problems that we, we face all these years. Okay. So when you decided, decided to write the book, what, was, what did you do first? What was your first step? Well, you know, like everybody, when they want to write a book, they first have to research, you know, and find out all the facts. What, what are the real problems? What are the statistics? Until you get all the facts right, you know, then you can start to formulate how to solve all these problems. So one of the ways, one of the reasons we've done is to approach experts in the field to let them tell us what they think and how can they help us solve the problems. All right, so who were some of the initial experts you approached? Well, Keller Wong was at Iron Pace office and while there, there are many people that came through the office and, and became a very known, very well known architects themselves. And one of them is William Peterson, who, who, who left Iron Pace office and formed, the, formed his own office called KPF, which is Combe, Peterson and Fox. So, so we reached out to William Peterson first and discussed with him. And the, and the second person we reached out is Dennis Poon, a structural engineer that has been designing a, many tall buildings all around the world. And we, we knew him <coughs> socially as a friend. So from then, from these two people, they recommended more people for us to, to interview. And after about a few months, we have come to a point that it seems like a never-ending process. And we decided we had to put a stop to this interview because otherwise we'd never finish the book. So you interviewed over, over 30 people? Yes. And mm -hmm. then um, what did you do after, your, after having collected all that information? Oh, well, oh then we, we sat down and analyzed all the, all the issues that we talked with all the experts and formulate the table of contents, what we should write in the book. Uh -huh. And so by synthesizing all this information, that's essentially how the vertical city concept was born. Yes. All right, so instead of it being just uh, one man's isolated idea, it's it's a collection of the best ideas from the yeah. best minds in, in their yeah. related fields. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a collection of all the best minds in the field. And these experts are really the, the, the most knowledgeable people in the construction field and some in the social field as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, I know the book has sections on, on technology, uh, sustainability, uh, also social welfare. Yes. Okay. When did you start using the term vertical city? I think very soon, very shortly after we started, started the book because we knew you know, in order to solve the problem, we have to save the farmland. And in order to save the farmland, we have to go very, very high. Uh -huh. And the reason we, we picked a number like a mile is because way back in the 50s, Frank Lloyd Wright already has a concept of mile high building. And we thought that was a good term to use. Uh -huh. And we also realized that we, we do have the technology to build a building up to that height without waiting for any few further technology to help us. Yeah, this is what Dennis Poon and uh, Les... Yeah, yeah this, is, this, is, 
this is the information we got when we interviewed Dennis Poon and Leslie E. Robinson. Leslie Robinson, yes. Yeah. All right, excellent. So one of the key concepts of Vertical City that distinguishes it from a multifunction building is, is that it's not a building in isolation, right? Instead of, a, it's many different towers that are connected together by these sky lobbies. Yes. Was there anything that, that inspired you to this concept or what? Yes, yes. In a way, build a building to such height, you know, the, most, the biggest problem is the wing load. And today they, they have find a way or technology to, to handle the wing load. But when you want to build a building twice as high as what's available today, you know, the wing load problem becomes a truly different uh, problem. And, uh, you know, most vertical cities designed today are all pyramidal in form. They have a big base and taper up to a point. Most towers. Most, most tall towers, buildings. yes. And the reason for that is because there's a very big moment at, at the base of the building to resist the ring load. There are other ways to, to, to mitigate this problem, you know, by, by, by using a very heavy mass at the, at the top of the building that can move backwards and forwards and sideways, you know, to, 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 to counteract the wing load. And uh, this works very well. But I think for, for a building twice as high, I think even this kind of a technique will not be sufficient. Uh -huh. So, so you know, structurally, there's a very simple way to handle that. If we tie all the buildings together, you know, laterally, the building will support each other and just reduce the, the uh, stress at the base of the building. Mm -hmm. but with this method, we can eliminate the use of a pyramidal form to design tall buildings. And these, these sky lobbies, they also serve functions that are non-structural, is that correct? And, 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 the sky, and, and this can be very, very convenient because, you know, when the elevator goes, goes up so many floors, it, you know, it takes time to, for people to, to reach their floors. So for a building as high as uh, a mile high, we can probably have 400 floors in the building. Approximately 100 floors you know, intervals, to, to have a sky lobby at every 100 floors intervals, that, that, that makes it very logical to rely on, on the uh, robust elevator as an express elevator to, to bring people up to that 100 floor level, and we call it the sky lobby. A, a sky lobby is a, a, is a horizontal building that links all, this, all the vertical buildings together. And it, and it has several floors in height. We, we, we can call the sky lobby some kind of a village center. You know, you can have all the functions of a village, like sh shops, grocery, st grocery stores, you know, shoe, shoe stores and repairs and all that in, in the in a, in a enclosed part of the sky lobby. And on the roof of the sky lobby, we can have gardens, parks, gardens, swimming pools, and sports facilities, and together with restaurants, bars, and coffee houses, so that people can use it as a, as a meeting, meeting place to get to know its neighbors and entertain their friends. So by building vertical cities and making these, these spaces, not just single buildings, but um, structures that contain multiple buildings and horizontal spaces in the sky, literally, this can alleviate a lot of the problems that our current cities face. Well, I think a vertical city can actually eliminate all the problems that we have. Well, I, 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 I don't dare to say all the problems, but I think it can eliminate most of the problems that we are facing today. Like, for instance, how to save the land for agriculture, how to eliminate the pollution, how to recycle the waste, how to generate en renewable energies. And these, are, these can all be incorporated in vertical cities. Okay. I've heard you claim that a true vertical city 
mm. can uh, dramatically help reduce congestion problems as opposed to a, a multifunctional building. Absolutely. True vertical city, the most important element that we advocate is the size that people can walk within 10 to 15 minutes and reach every part of the city. So there will be no need for, for vehicles to, uh, to take people around. And the only, only thing we, we will have is, is elevators. And we now have developed the robust elevators that can travel without, uh, without the constraint of a rope and can go up as high, high as we need and as fast as we need. So, 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 so with the development of robust elevator, it will make the vertical city truly functional. How, how many people can a vertical city hold? I think we did some calculations and to, to make it very generous for, for average apartment, say for three or four people to be something like 140 square meters. Okay. Yes. And, and we, we also tally up how much commercial space we need and how much, how much uh, a governmental space we need. I think for roughly for a building of 400 stories high. And there may be 10 or 12 vertical buildings together at various heights. All together, it can hold a city of up to 250,000 people. What's the, the footprint of this megastructure? Well, we come to a point about 10 city blocks. We take New York City as a, as a, as a dimension. 10 city block is half a mile. So half, half a mile square will be our maximum size for a vertical city. Okay. So by increasing the density, you're obviously able to preserve more of the ground plane. Yes. Yes. Uh, please elaborate a little bit on the, the benefits of doing this. The benefit of doing this is we try to provide the vertical city without sacrificing the area for human needs. You know, most people think that when you put in so many people in a vertical city, people will be squeezed into a 40 or 50 square meter space. It is not true. We can have a residence for up to 200 or 300 square meters without any problems. So, so it's not this footprint that causes the congestion. It's how we design the vertical city mm -hmm. that can prevent all the congestions. Okay. Uh, what are some of the major benefits of reducing the footprint? so that we don't need vehicles to help us get from A to B. And without the vehicles, we, then we, we don't have the pollution. Is, is density tied to energy efficiency? Well, absolutely. Our concept of vertical city is the city can be designed totally energy neutral. That means we don't have to bring a drop of oil into the city to generate power. All the power are generated by renewable means. You know, at the height of one mile, the winds are more steady. So, so our wind, wind generators are more efficient. And there are many other ways to, to generate power. The surface of the, of the, ex, the ex, exterior wall of the building can all be part of the energy, energy generating process. And the, the elevator, the robust elevator will use power going up, but it will generate power coming down. And we also have the technology today to generate power on the road elevators also, but it won't be as efficient as the uh, robust elevators to generate power on the way down. Mm -hmm. um, also, I read an article recently that was talking about the difference in temperature yes. uh, from the ground level to for it's a mile high. Yes. How does this play into the vertical city concept? Well, every 1,000 feet up in the air, the temperature reduces by about 2 to 2.5 two 
he resintegrate. You know, when you build a building at a height of a mile high, you can reduce reduce the temperature. Uh, the, the temperature difference will be about 12 to 14 degrees at the top. So on 40 degree temperature day at the ground level, at, at a mile high, would be only something like 24, 25 degrees. And, and if we bring down the air at that height, it will be very co comfortable for people to live in vertical cities at that temperature one, you know, without using air conditioning. How does vertical city affect food production and agricultural systems? Well, most countries are already running out of land to grow food, and especially, especially China. I think China has to import up to 20% of food to, to supply its citizens. I think this is the first time China has to rely on importing food. So, so this is not a good thing. The vertical city uses one or two percent of the land as compared to a conventional city. So with the 98 percent of the land left, you know, we, we suggest the vertical city we, to use the same amount of land as building a conventional city. But instead of putting all the buildings Instead of covering the whole site with buildings, we only build, the vertical city only takes up 1-2% to of the land. The other 98-99% of the land can be used for agriculture to supply food for the residents of the vertical city. You've lived in various cities throughout your life. Uh, you are born in Shanghai, right? Yes. Educated in London. in London and then I've spent, what, 50 years in New York. Yes. How has your experience in these different cities impacted your view of the world and helped you develop this, this idea? Uh, strangely enough, most of the large cities function very much the same way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so when I go from one city to another city, I feel there's very little dif difference that I have to adopt, uh, adapt. Uh -huh. And... Uh, they all have the same problems, like the traffic, like the pollution. And they also have the same advantage, like the opera house, like like a lot of <clears throat> museums and concerts and, and uh, cult cultural events. Uh -huh. so, so it's a balance. But we, we would like to change all that and do cities today to, to eliminate all the problems that we, that we have and, and come up with a new lifestyle that can improve, in, can improve our way of life. Were there any significant <clears throat> moments in your life that really kind of got you thinking in a different way about cities and, and the potential of our cities? Yes. You know, after the Second World War, the technology and industry developed at such a rate that the infrastructure of cities cannot catch up. And this is causes the, the, all, all the traffic to be congested. And this is not the only problem. The, the, the city has been growing leaps and bounds. And, and nobody knows where the city limits should be. And when a city gets too large, the, the problem get not only multiplies, but it quadruples. So, so the, the city today, in many cities today, have, have the traffic problem that is almost intolerable. It takes them more than an hour to, by car to go from one end of town to the other end. And this is not acceptable in a modern city that we have to, to, to go from places to places and go from meetings to meetings in, in a car that will take so long to reach. Right. If you're in if you're in Beijing, you're not going to get there in an hour. It's going to yes. take you two or three. Right. Go from one end to the other. Right. And and that is not totally unacceptable. There seems to be a lot of significant benefits that would would come about from the building of, of vertical cities. What do you think has prevented them from currently being constructed, and what might it take for them to be built in the future? I believe that. People today are very conscious about ecology and sustainability, but they still cannot see a whole picture of how 
the whole thing can be put together. Uh-huh. And when you talk to knowledgeable people, they can see immediately this is a this vertical city can be built today. But still, there, there, there are a lot of people in this world that are not so conversed with all the construction technologies that we have. So I think it is important for us to find ways to reach out to these people, especially people in the government, where they have to make the decision to, to build vertical cities. So where do you see the first vertical city being built, or is it likely to be constructed? Well, there are many cities that, that really desperately need, and I really cannot tell you which city will be the first. I think, I think the, the very uh, likely candidates are Mumbai and, and Beijing and Shanghai. These are all very like, likely candidates. Do you, do you think that um, countries like like India and Indonesia, do they have the, the financial capabilities and, and the infrastructure necessary? Even if they don't have the financial capabilities, they need cities for urbanization. Mm-hmm. Urbanization costs, costs money to build, and vertical city costs less money to build. So they should be able to build vertical cities as well. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. They're gonna to have to. They're gonna to have to build cities either way. Yes, so why not because build because in because India is going through a rapid urbanization, but not as rapid as China, but still it's a rapid urbanization. Mm-hmm. So in China, do you think that the the government, the system here, would benefit or hinder the development of rural cities? Well, we just don't know what they are thinking. But from what we read in the paper, ecology and urbanization are two most important things on their mind. And if they see, if they can see our book, they will come to conclusion that this has to be their choice. All right. Thank you for this interview. It's been very entertaining. Uh, with just a few minutes left, I'm curious if you have any call to actions you would like to make to any of our listeners. I think it's important, you know, for us to let the whole world know that this vertical city is possible to build and is a solution for all urban problems that we face today. How how uh, how do we let the world know? It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Share the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. Right, absolutely. Do you have any other uh, other thoughts you want to talk about? Yes, I think the vertical city will happen sooner or later because there are no other ways to solve our urban problems today. And I think the city needs this solution now than later. So we hope that the people in position will come to, the, to know vertical city. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. See you next time.